Good evening once again, friends, data scientists, data analysts, bioinformatics, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, policymakers, and of course, friends all alike. It is now 12.24 a.m. at July 18, 2021. All right, to start off, before we go through our databases, or data sources, I should say, for our fact checkers, we're going to look at reported deaths to the VARES, VARES, VARES system, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And these are reported deaths not to be confirmed as of yet. I'm going to show you an interesting trend, and then we'll go into our data sources. Ready? Reported deaths to VARES, and this was started from January 1st, 2021, up to July of this year. Let me back it up just a little bit, make it a little smaller there. And here we go. All right, here we are. See? Now, check this out. Next one is reported COVID mortality, starting from January 1st again, going through July up to present date. All right, now we do the comparison between the two. This is the vaccine adverse event reporting system as far as mortality being reported to the VARES system. And this is mortality being reported to COVID uh, in the wild per se. All right, now let's take a snippet right here. Let's start, I think I picked it up at June 7th. So we're looking right around here and here we are. COVID mortality to VARES for death reports from June 7, 2021 to present. Green line is being those, unfortunately, which perished from the coronavirus or COVID-19. And those currently, as far as vaccine adverse event reports occurring as is. Now, there's a lot of confounding that can be thrown into this as far as bias itself. But I just noticed it's an interesting trend as far as the mortality being reported to the vaccine adverse event reporting system and the natural mortality in reference to COVID-19. All right, let's get right into the research as follows. Here we go. And then we'll get back to this in a second. All right, data sources are as follows. We would actually data. Let's do our data sources first for the fact checkers. We're going to the VARES adverse event reporting system. We're also going to the uh, HHS.gov as far as uh, vaccination rates. Outbreak.info. Look at this. Now, what Outbreak.info just recently did is now they included all of the variants. If you notice right here, going back 365 days. Now, in a very, very not, you know, in a little bit of a morbid way, unfortunately, this, whoever did the, uh, the uh, graphic on here, it looks like artwork. Unfortunately, it's in relation to something which is obviously quite tragic. But you could see this is a very, very, very uh, eye-catching chart. All right. And then, for example, also our world and data. And we'll be utilizing uh, them as well as far as the COVID-19 Data Explorer. And they have obviously done a great job. All right. Now, what we're looking at right here, too. I want you to keep, let's, let's just, let's cover this first. Well, no, let's cover the articles first. Let's take that back. All right, we're going to be looking at update number six in reference to mask effectiveness or face coverings, however you want to word it. John Hopkins University uh, publishing a wonderful element as far as supplement, can dietary supplements help the immune system fight off coronavirus? We will be looking at the futility of utilizing antibiotics for COVID-19. In this case, azithromycin. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. We'll look at the quickly, uh, obviously, uh, how we describe it, very, very, very short. Uh, now, there's a lot that goes with the immune system, T cells as well as antibodies. So again, it's not to bemoan the entire issue. But however, though, the extremely short duration of antibodies in reference to COVID-19, and this was in reference to the B117 strain, and now let's get back to this real fast since we're here anyways. All right. You read a lot of articles like this. And then we'll go. We'll, just give me one second here. We read a lot of articles as far as the Indian Delta variant. What I would like you to do, you know, as far as like what I have done without me adding any biases or preluding it, is if you were to look at this Delta variant, looking at the data, looking at the data uh, per se, in reference to how it has impacted things globally, what would be your observation in reference to the potential outcome 
of this as aspect in reference to viral pathogen replacement, or I should say the Indi Indian Delta variant becoming the predominant strain. All right, so let's look at this real fast. So I want you to keep this in mind because this plays a huge role in reference to um, how you're going to formulate your decision. Nope, not the wrong one. That's right there. All right. Now, this is the amount of individuals that have been fully vaccinated in India. So what are we looking at there? It's actually closer to 6% compared to the United States here. And then you have Taiwan. That's the percentage of individuals who have been fully vaccinated. And we all know the rate of mortality in Taiwan is mysteriously low. India, 6% maybe uh, fully vaccinated. And then South Korea, which you would think about one of the areas where it was the progenitor, progenitor or the beginning of this potential viral vector, uh, not really enthused about being vaccinated. So United States, rah, 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 vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Now the objective here is without adding confounding or bias is for your, you to decide as a policymaker uh, exactly how much of a th potential threat, not, not to, every, uncertainty could be weaponized in a very effective fashion. So, you know, if you want to make everything certain, you never fly, you never drive, you never leave the house i.e. lockdown. But otherwise, outside of that, now you make the determination. Now let's look at the Delta variant as far as how it applies to India. So let's go into our database real fast. Ba, ba, da, ba. All right, let's go right here. We'll come back to this a little bit in reference to the vaccine reactions. Uh, and also too, for those short on time, let's see if I can at least give you the information that you're looking for real fast. Um, just gonna look real fast, pull up here. Uh, it looks like we go down a little bit here. Da 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 da. And individuals often wait because it's very difficult to go to the CDC database and as far as finding out the total number of vaccine adverse event reports accumulating per week. We are right coming up on it here. We're at 412,146 vaccine adverse event reports up to this time at June 18th, 2020. No, I think it was. July 2nd, let's update that real fast. Hang on, please forgive me. It is actually supposed to be July 9th. So again, you may see me fix this a little bit. So it's July 9th, 2021. And so, hmm, I don't think it's that high. Well, maybe it did update to uh, let's see which report are we looking at. It's very possible, i.e. font size. Looking at the reaction table, looking at my data sources here. The length of the CDC, yeah, it could be up to, no, it can't be up to 547,000. All right, we're going to re rerun this whole thing real fast, and we'll come back to it in a second. I think it was 412,000 to be accurate. What's happened here is it's counting duplicates. Now, this is a major error that can occur in reference to individuals which are basically um, not familiar with duplicates being put in the database, and I'll show you why. It should come back, but it's like 412,000. We'll come back to that in a second. That wouldn't be a pure anticlimactic. All right, let's go to our mutations. Let's back to the Delta variant. All right, so let's go to India. Let's look at India real fast. Whoop, wrong way. We'll come back to that a little bit. Da, 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 sorry, Red Queen. All right, India. So there is your India Delta variant. All right, this is your vaccination rate. Now keep in mind, vaccinations are at 5.9%. All right, so now we look at mortality to the variant. All right, there is your there is your variant, covered up here by the um, New Death Smooth per million. Look at the drop there. Look at the rise there. Look at the drop there. All right, and Again, you have to make the decision. Uh, how is what the major media, I don't like using the word major media, is what the predominant media at the time, the bias that's installed doesn't mean it's not correct, but the assumption that they're making, is it correct? Let's put it that way. So there's your mortality rate after B1617-2 has taken almost full hold in India. There's that. There is your positivity rate. 
Look at that. Look at that. That's your positivity rate, the B1617.2. That is just incredible. Now, if we look at, for example, let's look at something else a little cleaner to see. Uh, let's look at India. 6% is our control. There's that drop in mortality on a larger scale. There is their drop in cases per million, even though their testing is fairly high. Now, let's go back to that original statement there. We're going to basically state, would you validate that? Statement, not to be moaned, some major published, uh, uh, major media groups, my gosh, I'm just some guy right here, sitting in the back of his computer, playing with Python, uh, pulling out data sources. So when you look at that, and you look at this, per se, and then you look at, for example, again, mutations of Red Queen, I get messed up there, and you look at that, what hypothesis can you draw in reference to the lethality not just the, and potentially even the transmissibility. Looking at the positivity rate, once B172 took full hold through viral pathogen replacement. Look at this. Check this out. This, see, you know, as, as far as that right there, or what is it? Again, you draw your own hypothesis and uh, try to uh, make a decision in reference to the um, urgency or concern in reference to B1617-2. All right, let's get right into the research articles as follows. Ba, ba, ba. We run through that. Oh, check this out too. Check this out. You ready? Now, this is actually interesting. Now, this is India. No, that's India. Let's, for example, just to show you, I want to. Get, this, this gives you a good idea of how uh, Outbreak Info works at the exact same time. If we look at India, as far as their sequences, and give it a second. Of course, now everything's moving slow. I got something backing up there. Let's try one more time. India, generate report. And let's see what comes up here. Round and round we go. And it gives you an idea where exactly that, that particular Indian Delta variant currently is. And uh, basically, look at that. Is that amazing or what? There, there, there it goes. All right. Yeah, looks like pure chaos. There's B1617-2. It's predominant. In fact, it made it like everything else. I mean, if you talk about viral pathogen replacement, it made everything else go bye-bye. And look at that. And then again, look at the positivity rate. Look at the mortality rate. Again, conjecture, hypothesis, confounding, lots of biases involved. Is it a study? No, it's just an observation. From that observation, then you can make your hypothesis and then see if that hypothesis, null hypothesis, or whatever it is, alternative hypothesis, is, blah, 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 hypothesis, is proven or not. All right, let's get right to the research articles as follows. Talk about hypotheses. Update our loop number six. This is almost like a running inside, I don't want to say joke, but however, though, from a a statistical standpoint and a science standpoint, a reference to the arguments in utilizing face coverings and masks, they're not doing anything to say they don't work. What they're claiming is they have found, like a, through April 2nd, found no eligible studies that meet the acid test criteria to be actually counted as a study that could be relied upon. So this is what they said. The sixth update alert for a living rapper review on the use of masks for prevention of respiratory virus infections, including SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare and community settings. And of course, is the Annals of Internal Medicine. Da da da, found no eligible studies. All right, we'll go to there. Um, in addition to adjusted risk estimates were not reported. This, this is how they break down studies. On the basis of three observational studies, blah, 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 surgical mask, N95, you get the point. Uh, one new cross-sectional study in the United States found no statistically significant differences in risk for SARS-CoV-2 zero positivity between N95 respirators and surgical mask use. The study had methodological limitations, including potential recall bias and a 50% participation rate. So they said, you know, the data remains insufficient, but we go, we go further. 
Because of inconsistent estimates and few studies, the strength of evidence for consistent mask use and the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection remains insufficient. How long has this thing been going on? You know, we looked at a lot of articles in reference to research uh, questioning utilization of masks. But the problem is they haven't found any studies, not some guy in the lab checking the moisture retention and moisture exposure in a lab setting. We're talking real world settings. Here we go. P proceed. In community settings, the strength of evidence remains low for an association between any mask use versus no mask use or surgical mask use versus no mask use. And this is in reference to SARS-CoV-1 uh, uh, as well. But to conclude, given few new eligible studies and little change in conclusions after one year, one year of monthly or bi-monthly updates, we will update and reevaluate the need for continued updates again in six months. So, you know, you see what I mean? They're, they're, they're not saying that anybody is wrong. They're just saying that not necessarily are they right. That's the problem. And of course, I know a lot of you independent thinkers out there basically, you know, we feel like, how would you describe it, being bullied into this virtue signaling. And it's frustrating, again, because not necessarily you're looking to prove anybody wrong. It's basically no one out there after, what was it again, to reiterate, uh, one year of monthly, bi-monthly updates have not been proven right. So again, it's an interesting aspect because you watch politicians fall in line, a lot of fear, and again, weaponized uncertainty. And they could be right. But however, though, no data supports that particular argument at this point in time. Henceforth, from the annals of internal medicine, is that really any less valid than people claiming that the Delta variant can be more lethal? when the data in the areas where the Delta variant, the Indian Delta variant is almost 100%, doesn't seem to have the observational data to support these claims. It's kind of funny because you think about it, if you look at fake news per se, then what happens if the people, well, I'm not gonna say anything, but you know what I mean. Seriously, you know exactly what I mean. Now let's go to John Hopkins University, another university I love and great statistics courses. COVID-19 news, can dietary supplements help the immune system fight coronavirus infection? All right, let's read through here. Uh, and the thing about it is when we go to the abstract, the full study is not published. However, though, there's one gold mine of information we'll look at in a second. Uh, Mullen, Mullen, please forgive me if I've mispronounced, Associate Professor of Medicine at John Hopkins University School of Medicine and, and his colleagues shine a light on melatonin, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and several plant-based compounds such as green tea, curcumin, curcumin, and I'll have to explain the ascorbic acid, also one of those vitamin C, well, ascorbic acid, ascorbic palmitate, of course, uh, calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate, you know what I mean. It just lot C comes under many names. Contributes to immune system defense by supporting cell functions of both the innate and adaptive immune systems. I'm only reading their words. And in the journal that they discuss it, zinc they write down has been shown to inhibit coronavirus RNA replication. I am reading fact checkers. I am not making a medical claim. I am reading a medical journal. And they also note that when administered as symptom onset, zinc can reduce the duration of symptoms from illness attributed to more innocuous coronavirus infections, such as the common cold. For example, Mullen, Mullen says, to date, there are abundant data associating low vitamin D status with to higher vulnerability to COVID-19 and poor clinical outcomes. Again, to the researchers out there, if you're going to do a study on vitamin D, you have to measure the magnesium levels as well as the D levels because you all know by now magnesium is required to make vitamin D fairly effective. But to proceed, let's go into the abstract itself. This is what I want to show you. All right. Unfortunately, it's very anticlimactic. It's a pay to play uh, chapter. You, know, you have to buy in order to read it, which kind of sucks because you think about it. If you, have, if you want to spend 30 bucks, you have a, you will have an advantage over other elements of society looking to avoid. See, thinking, isn't that kind of weird? Here you have this, I mean, again, you have to keep in mind, John Hopkins did the research. 
They deserve to basically benefit from that research. However, though, you know, you're thinking about it. Here is information that could potentially be life saving. Give me 30 bucks. You see what I mean? But, however, though, here is the gold mine. You ready? Look at this. All these references, as far as different vitamins and so on and so forth, basically down the line. And I and this will give you a plethora of information in order to pursue in basically drawing a library of defensive nutritional, how would you describe it, tools in reference to potentially anything along the lines of a coronavirus. There's Veritrol, uh, vitamin D again. And you ready for this? Check this out. Here it goes. I don't have, I'll have the link in the YouTube video itself. And this way you can follow and go through all the footnotes uh, ad lib. Is it ad lib? Ad libitum. I know that's a dietary term for research as far as eating freely, as many of us have done during the coronavirus pandemic lockdowns. But here we go. Ready? Da da da. Look at this. I'm going to move slow. This alone, I, wanted, I want you to get a decent perspective as far as how much effort and work has been put into accumulating all this data. So if you want to validate this individual's information in reference to 2995, it's done well. And I'm still going down the line. This is all the footnotes. Enough to make a high school teacher smile. All right, so there you are. So basically, the data they utilize, if I get back there, do, 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 is well documented and it's <laughs> broke. And it will give you one, the freaking heck, amount of information in reference to all of the footnotes and references that you can basically go through at will, um, all compiled together in one area. So I think that's really cool from uh, the, the people at John Hopkins University. Again, this, the people often think of, for example, a lot of the medical establishment as far as being anti-nutritional supplement. I think uh, one thing the pandemic has did out of the desperation just to find things that work outside of the political biases that may be involved is gave a new appreciation for um, nutritional therapy. And so that's actually kind of cool. All right. So again, I'll have the link to the abstract and, of course, this study here, which has a few more down below. But this is the one I wanted to focus on. Here it is. Just going to read through it. Common COVID-19 antibiotic, no more effective than a placebo. Azithromycin, a broad spectrum antibiotic, is widely prescribed as a treatment for COVID-19. This is important because a lot of countries, for example, like India, they went ballistic on antibiotics and during this pandemic. But this is why this information needs to be propagated uh, in order to basically have people not make the wrong choice. You know what I mean? The hypothesis is that the anti-inflammatory properties may prevent progression if treated early in disease. We did not find this to be the case, according to the researcher. The study included da 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 participants. Sorry, so you have 70 burn study, no more hospital line, da da da. I'm only going fast because I know you can read this all alone. On your own. We received a single 1.2 gram oral dose of azithromycin and 92 received an identical placebo. At day 14 of the study, 50% of participants remained symptom free in both groups. By day 21, five participants who received azithromycin had been hospitalized with severe symptoms of COVID 19 and none. Wait a second, I didn't read that part. None of the placebo group had been hospitalized. Let's highlight that real fast. None of the placebo group have been hospitalized. All right, to reiterate, because again, this is the first time I'm reading it myself. I highlighted it, but obviously I failed in reading comprehension here. Again, um, trying to make things go real fast before we did the study here. I read through the study. At day 14 of the study, 50% of the participants remained symptom-free in both groups. By day 21, five of the participants who received azithromycin had been hospitalized with severe COVID-19 and none of the placebo group had been hospitalized? All right. Most of the trials done so far with azithromycin, azithromycin had been focused on hospitalized patients. Obviously, if they're taking that, they would be hospitalized uh, with pretty severe disease. That's not publisher bias. That's just an observation. Our paper is one of the first placebo-controlled studies shows a no role 
for azithromycin in outpatients. Again, once again, to the fact checkers, I am not making any medical claims or whatever. I'm just reading the study verbatim, not adding publisher bias either. All right, again, once again, let's move forward. Ba ba ba. This is interesting. Ready for this one? The care home residents. Now, I've alluded to this in the very first part of the video. All right, but this is in reference to the variant B117 strain. Now, obviously, you heard the information in reference to the vaccine not being as effective uh, with the ba 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 b16172 strain so that makes it quite interesting so if the b117 strain did that poorly then the b16172 one in reference to the vaccine may not do quite as well either but again that's conjecture but here we go uh there was an outbreak uh after a month of campaign to double vaccinate residents and staff with the pfizer Bio biotech jab had ended so you're talking about a month later you say all right here's your your vaccination rate Tested the samples of blood taken by the researchers on April 6th, I guess a month after the campaign, showed that all but one of the fully vaccinated residents had antibodies against COVID-19. Again, the caveat, there's T cells and other elements of the immune system as well, but still just the same. That's what it showed. Are you ready for this? Now, I want you, this is, read through this carefully. Here we go. 12 of the 24 infected. So what's that? 50% had not been fully vaccinated. So 12 had been fully vaccinated. 12 had not been fully vaccinated. And they all became infected. All right, so here we go. And you got obviously some other things in reference to the staff itself. The estimated effectiveness of the vaccine in elderly residents was 68%. And that was the B117 alpha strain. Now, of course, you heard the possible vaccine effectiveness against the B1 ah, 6172 strain uh, is even less than potentially this strain. So who knows what the updated information will be as follows. But again, food for thought, and the link will be there to follow on your own. Uh, again, uh, with the pandemic ebbs and flows, I look at data and the data, for example, of populations which have not been fully vaccinated. For example, only 6%. How much of an effect, how much effect has the vaccine had? Has the vaccine had more of an effect than the predominance of the new strain or variant? Can are all variants harmful or can variant actually be helpful? under the guise of viral pathogen replacement. So do you want to declare war on a variant that may have a different observational outcome than other variants? Again, I don't know, too much uncertainty. And I'm not, a, and again, I can't give anybody any absolute answers and I don't think anybody should. But here, look at the, look at the mortality rate. Just like, fall, not like that, but it fell dramatically. And remember how India was in the news and. They were like, the hospitals were full and everything else like that. And all of a sudden now you don't hear anything about India because it's inconvenient. So here we go. Let's get right into the data analytics as follows. Let's go to the VARES vaccine adverse event report database to start with eventually. Right, let's start at the top. All right. And wow, that's really moving slow. Here we go. Do, do, do. Now again, the information that we're utilizing. Well, let's do this real fast. The mutation report. Uh, no, this one. All right. This is the zip drive size, comparatively, right? The zip files. Compare it to all the years prior. If you don't know what I mean exactly, if you're new to this, this channel, this is what I mean. There's your zip file size. And this zip file contains all the data. And you compare this zip file size of 88.84 megabytes to all the years of the symptoms and vaccine adverse event reports all the way down the line. And when you do that and you put it in a bar chart, in this case, it's Seaborn, this case, it's just Matplotlib, you come up with that contrast. You see what I mean? And also too, just so we can, don't have to come back to this thing right here. Here, it, oh, we are gonna come back to it anyways. I'm gonna show you Arkansas. But let's go back to the vaccine adverse event report first. Ready, here we go. Do, 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 da, ba, ba. All right, do, do, do. There we come. There's our thrombocytopenia reactions to the database. 
showing 585 so far, the average age right about there. As we basically, you know, scrape data from the database itself, you can, and this is the paralysis. I'm not showing you the full symptom text, and I know there is Guillaume Barre, uh, basically references that have been popping up. A lot of, let's see, like, like, like a duplicate, you see right there? Yeah, that's probably a duplicate. That's going to be weeded through. Uh, but you can see exactly what I mean. And so we're looking at that. And there's your, basically, you describe you're familiar with pandas. There's your paralysis by age. Happens to be a little bit lower than the 60 line. There's 329 cases of paralysis. At least where paralysis pops up in the symptom columns. For those not familiar, I'm not talking symptom text. There are symptom columns all the way towards the end, which is a huge, huge, huge right there. That's where they're going to pop up. All right. So that's it. Myocarditis reactions by age. Again, remember the unusual thing was 43.4 last week. Somewhere around 43 is the average age of myocarditis in the wild. Uh, but vaccine reaction, though, that's real odd, especially for that young of age. Something, something does not I mean, it could be psychological after a point in time. People start looking for it more often. But something's really uh, odd with that if you're looking, comparing to the general, general wild. You know some parts of my words real cautiously. All right, here we go. Thrombosis, clotting reactions by age. Do -do -do, right down there. And it's like a 2402. Again, if you punch in blood clots, you're going to find two or three. You got to do thrombosis. And for those data analytics out there looking for research, you have to look for the word thrombosis. And like that is in. So you build your database, type in thrombosis, make sure it's not necessarily case sensitive, and then boom, you'll, you'll get your data. Uh, again, the CDC, uh, the VAERS database is not easy to go through. All right, this is odd. COVID-19 illness reactions by age. I put the question marks here because it's it's really unusual. Uh, but so far, 10,086 cases of COVID-19. Now, all right, ooh, 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 almost forgot one thing. Now, th there's, a, there's, there's a possible correlation hypothesis, and it was actually done by another manufacturer of, of vaccines themselves. And I think it has to do with retrotransposin. Trans, trans, Let's look at it real fast. All right, this is what we got here. All right, there's a wonderful article basically on, this is going to, people are not going to know how to reconcile two thoughts at the same time here, being pro-vaccine, but anti-certain vaccines or questioning certain vaccines. And basically the discovery in the research is something called the RBD vaccine. All right, and this was done here, uh, basically at Kingsborough Community College and the University of the Department of Biological Sciences. In development of basically a new vaccine, that one that's safer and more effective, that basically people with autoimmune diseases can take. And it goes to the entire list. You notice here it has a big question mark. It's like SARS, BAT, huh? You know, it's like the missing link from evolution. It's like right there. And so I like to put the question mark there. Uh, but, you know, they were, they were trying to overcome, you know, for example, the long-term exposure to hardship during maternity, cause delays in embryonic development. This is all due to the lockdown, due to imbalances in neuroendocrine immune system and damage to telomeres. So, again, you, they're, they're trying to find ways not to have a lockdown. So they want to develop a better vaccine that can be taken more uh, by more individuals with less side effects and, uh, and basically, you know, get people out and about without having to they, you'd be isolated and locking down even if you're fully vaccinated. I mean, my gosh, that's that's odd. And so here we go. And so it's called the receptor binding domain. And they found it to be very uh, farly more effective, fairly more effective. But I'm going to read through here and be really, really uh, uh, touchy. And I'm not going to want to add any publisher bias per se. But this is the risk associated with certain types of vaccines. If you notice, I didn't say the word. But so just keep in mind, I'm doing this for a couple of different reasons. One is because um, I don't want this to get censored. And number two, at the same time, uh, in the development in the hope of more effective vaccines that have a broader range of um, assistance, you know, it's the thing. I mean, if you criticize a vaccine, it's not because you're being criticizing vaccines as a whole school of medicine. You can criticize one element of that school and say, hey, we can improve upon that. 
And so this is what they're trying to do. And so, for example, there have been situations of viral RNA vaccines to recombine with similar other viral genomes in circulation to the recipient's plasma affecting the RNA vaccines. And it goes through the cultures and things like that. And here's one thing really weird, which comes up every single time. And I don't know why. Remember, like, uh, last week, uh, an HIV patient uh they end up mutating where they couldn't fight off the virus, but end up mutating, then re-entering itself and you know, become like uh, what they used to call in polio, and they still do wild excretors. All right, so like this kind of forms like a wild excretor. And that word pops up a lot. And it just is kind of weird because a lot of the researchers and individuals that have worked on this, doesn't mean, you know, it's just there's correlation. HIV pops up a tremendous amount, and I don't know why. Uh, but reverse transcriptase, da da da. And again, I'm slowing this down so you can read through it on your own. Uh, you see what I mean? As far as mechanism of viral RNA replication in humans, retrotransposin, that's the word I was looking for. This is a word that will come up in the future, one way or the other. I, I could almost, I'm not almost, it is high, with a high probability. Retrotransposin. Why? Because when these vaccines right here were produced, this event they said was highly unlikely, virtually impossible. So let's see if that ends up being the case. They hypothesize that coronavirus invades human cells interacts with retrotransposins and may cause harm through retrotransposin dysregulation. The authors support our view that SARS-CoV-2 as protein mRNA vaccines as well as cDNA vaccines have the potential potential for the fact checkers i'm using to dualizing the word potential I'm not saying it does i'm saying potential to enter the human cell genome in a way that might harm the recipient again potential hypothesis and we let's scroll down here do, do, do. hence the rbd is an antigen for producing a vaccine to protect humans from sars will be highly specific and that's highly effective again they just they're not they're not saying you know they're just saying we could now that we have the information we could probably do a better job knowing what we can know when we know now and then they allude to, for example, this. I want to read to it without adding any publisher bias. Now the question remains to be answered, will the free S2 domain protein from the antigen produced by the mRNA vaccines allow entrance of any free SARS-CoV-2 virus into human mucosal cells and cause an infection and thus disease? What is the potential for the S2 domain to transfer the free floating? Part of the reason why is because this S2 thing that they said, they don't know why it's there. It's 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 actually more problematic than than it should be. Let's continue to read through it. What is the potential for the S2 domain to transfer the free-floating SARS-CoV-2 virus into the immune mucosal cells, causing infection and the disease? Furthermore, using the S2 domain independently as an antigen, da -da 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 -da, fail to produce neutralizing antibodies against infection by SARS-CoV. Hence, the free S2 domain released from S1 domain. Da -da -da -da, Produced by the mRNA vaccine plays no role to generate immunity against SARS-CoV-2 infections. So why is it there? And especially since it has the ability to not help. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Again, it's the parse of my words. And you go down, and that's what they're trying to say. And so in the conclusion, go through, and I'll link this. This is not a peer-reviewed article. It's a preprint. Uh, and it was just this June 23rd. But again, it, it's really an interesting uh, narrative in reference to developing as what they know now and developing more effective vaccinations. And so just something to keep an eye on, but I will link that as well. And again, this is a PDF file just as a heads up. So you have to download that PDF file in order to get to it. Let's minimize this once again. Now, knowing that about SARS-CoV-2, knowing that potentially about mRNA vaccines and basically S2, once again, going down here, potentially working as a transport mechanism, potentially. Uh, now, this comes up. And as you realize, I'm scrolling down here real fast. I'm just jumping through. It's 10,086 cases where COVID-19 doesn't mean they weren't defected ahead of time. And then they were vaccinated and they just had a breakthrough. But as you read through here, uh, you know, patient received the Pfizer, then tested positive of COVID, patient received the Pfizer. It, you know, it makes you wonder, uh, it makes you wonder, uh, you know, you read it all through here and this is just only part of them. This is not all of them. This just, I just broke it down. And I think we alluded to that last week, but so just food for thought, 
uh, food for thought. You see here the duplication again in various IDs. This is problematic, and that's going to have to be cleaned up. But just just food for thought. And now let's go back into the data and let go talk about cleaning things up for data analysts that are utilizing the vaccine adverse event reporting system in order to not artificially inflate the number of reactions. You have to keep in mind, for example, this is one ID, 21 reports, one ID. This means one individual filed 14 separate reports. So this should only be counting as one individual having one reaction, but it's duplicated quite often. So you got to make sure you, re you take these duplicates out. You see what I mean? And otherwise you'll have a, a false uh, a number much higher than it should be. For example, here's one ID, 1406023. This is one individual, and this is all of the symptoms that they experienced. If you can even read that on 4K, let's just knock that down like that. But you, you, you get the idea. All right, and let's go down the list. Do, do, do. All right, and da 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 scroll down. All right, this is vaccine reaction reports by vaccine, as you can see there. COVID-19 vaccine reports by age. Again, maybe seems superfluous, but it's fairly important. Almost like yeah, like a little bit of normalized bell curve there. Uh, Vaccine-related, reported vaccine-related deaths. Uh, we're getting a total of 5,000. We're getting at 62. Again, making sure that has to be validated. In reference to potential duplicates that could be in the database that can falsely inflate this. But in the same light, only 1% to 10% of all vaccine adverse event reports get actually reported to the VARA system. So again, take you know everything with a grain of salt. So I just consider this as a possible until it can be validated later on. But as I pointed out last week, when you have, what is it? This many reactions compared to all of the years, you have a, a, a there has to be an army of CDC personnel to be weeding through all these potential reaction reports because this is a tremendous amount of work. My, my concern is if there is not an army of CDC personnel weeding through all of the uh, vaccine adverse event reports, then what's the sense? How are you gonna catch a potential pattern if you're not paying attention? You know, you don't have the personnel to do it. All right, and that's, then let's go back to this. Here we go. All right, here we go. I mean, they, they, the problem is these reports, like for example, with Guillaume Barre or Guillaume Barr, if you want to pronounce it that way. You know, they should have caught those patterns, preferably earlier the better. You know what I mean? And so having 10 people go through all the vaccine adverse event reports, when you have millions of people being vaccinated at once, it's like, Huh? You know, that's they should have they should have an army of data analysts available just just to build the confidence. All right, this is the deaths per week and again seaborn freaking heck the timestamp came out with the minutes. It should have been you should not be seeing the zero zero zero. You should only be this. What I did is I just combined it by the week and obviously it came out yucky. But here we go. Da -da -da. We went through this already. Again. Uh, just keep an eye on that. It doesn't really mean anything per se. There's an interesting pattern, but you know, just just keep an eye on that. That's that's intriguing. All right, and then we go down the list. Do, 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 do. All right, day and week. We get that. Uh, rolling seven. Da da da. We don't have to worry about that. What is this? Here we go. We saw this. See. See what happened? See, it's back down to 412,146. So what happened was it, it rewrote itself on some of the code that it had down below. And it put the duplicates back in. And what we read, and we have to come back to it, was an overinflated number. It was like 540,000, whatever it was, because the duplicates were counted back in. So it actually increased the size of reactions by 20%, even though 412,146 is an incredibly high amount of reactions. Again, we have to maintain our validity and not get sloppy. And what happened before was my problem because I didn't plan on, I must have hit something and the duplicates counted back in, but now that's the number which is accurate. All right, so let's keep on going. 
do, 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 this is now we're going to minors, people under the age of 22 that have passed away. Again, uh, 18, 18, uh, you see a lot of this happens where basically just, yeah, you know, you could read through it on your own. Uh, and these are not people that you're just making things up going, oh, I just got vaccinated and just somehow uh, this 18 year old died of a blood clot shortly after, you know, being vaccinated. Let's give you an idea. So, for example, to show you how to read this received date. All right, then we go through here. And then it goes to, just so you know, do, 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 other meds, vaccine. And this, this is the, dot, the date that they passed away. And you get you get the idea, but I don't know if this is the full database or not, but I don't want to, you know, read the whole thing. You know, find, you know, like something superfluous like that. It's like, seriously, that's the diagnosis that I would expect to be more respectful for anybody. Uh, but you'll see a lot of the, a lot of the young, um, a lot of it has to do with hemorrhaging, heart. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, potentially other illnesses. Again, doesn't mean that the vaccine itself did it, but there could have been a relation, but I just too much heart stuff way too much heart stuff in the fatalities. And so, I mean, 13? And then when it started proving it under the age of 12? Uh, again, I'm not a policymaker. You decide. So here we go again, down the line. Da -da -da, lots of reading, lots of reading, lots of reading. All right, word cloud. Most common, most common uh, report uh, symptoms. Fatigue seems to be number one, headaches, so on and so forth, chills, fatigue. Breaking it down this way, top 30 reported symptoms. Let me make this a little smaller. I don't know how it got so big. Ready? So we get down. Where'd it go? And I'll give it a few seconds. There it is. Now, thank goodness, those words are going to froze for a second. There it is. Top 30 reported symptoms. Should be actually a little smaller, but I'm not going to risk it. And so you get back pain, for example, all the way down to this. Wow. Oh, this is, sorry. sorry, these are the people that died. This is the most uh, uh, most common symptoms of individuals that died. And wow, I must have skipped way ahead. Hang on. Here's the most common symptoms there. Uh, that's individuals as a whole, regardless of age. Now we go to the individuals that passed away. Uh, reported deaths. Cardiac arrest. Uh, it's really, that's, that's one of the number ones. And, you know, it's, that's what you see. Some of these stop words, I have to get out of there still just the same, but these unfortunately of the people that have perished, uh, COVID-19, you see there, that's what really makes me wonder. It just, it just gives food for thought. It doesn't, it just, it's odd because I don't know if it's within, you know, normal ranges or outliers, but looking at that, it's really weird. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of um, uh, those that reportedly passed away potentially in the database and after, shortly after in relation to correlation uh, to vaccination. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know why this is popping up so much. All right, then we look at vaccine reactions by age, minors. By week, not so much. Uh, these are all lot numbers that seem to be related to the most adverse event reports. Ooh, it's 49 minutes. I gotta move faster, people, I'm sorry. This is in children. Look at the size of the words. Remember, we looked at myocarditis. Way outside the normal range or age of individuals that get myocarditis. See right there? Top reported symptoms in children. And we have dizziness, headache, fatigue, and chest pain being number four. Uh, but again, you know, it's a lot of chest discomfort, a lot of circulatory issues, and again, some stop words I need to get out of there. Uh, but this is in children. Scroll down, and let's see what I have next. Remember the hypothesis? 
This is the vaccine that's being administered. As it drops down, the percentage of that begins to rise. What was the hypothesis? The hypothesis was that as you begin to coerce individuals into being vaccinated that don't want to be vaccinated, for whatever reason, they could be immunocompromised or whatever it came down to be, uh, you're probably going to start getting an elevate, elevated amount of vaccine adverse event reports. And that was the hypothesis. And so far, observationally, it looks like we have enough information where if we want to do a survival chart or Kaplan-Meier or a Cox pH fitter model or a Weibull, or Weibull, a Weibull chart, we could do a nice survival analysis and get a, a really good data in reference to a machine learning module now. Machine learning module, blah, blah, blah. All right, and then we go down there. Do, 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 do. This is the amount of days it takes before there's a, from reaction to report. Obviously, zero is most, but you know you can see it through there as far as quantity wise. Days till reaction, so on and so forth. And then the thrombosis we are looked at. Let's continue moving forward. All right, let's go to Red Queen. What do we have here? All right, let's look at our developed variants per se. I'm going to move real fast. Mortality to variant. Remember, India Delta variant, it's almost 100%. Look at mortality. Again, look at the data. If you have looked at the data more than you look at the news, it would tell a different story. If you had no news and all you had was honest charts, what would you be thinking? All right. That's the United States. That's USA. USA. That's India. Same type of pattern. India. India. That's positivity rate. Let's go down. Do 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 England. See right there. And what I was originally when I made this chart, what I was really legitimately doing is I was looking for viral pathogen replacement. And you know, this happened obviously, for example, with you know polio vaccines and things like that. So I was looking to see if basically as a vaccine against one variant began to rise, and that variant was basically diminished because it had less individuals in which to become a host of. Uh, would that open the door for other variants, viral path, pathogen replacement? That was my. That was what I was looking for. If you wanted to really know, look at this. There is. Look at this. You see, that's correlation. Now look at a correlation of three different countries. All right, just a heads up. Now Israel may be an exception. Right there. Is you know that's your vaccinations. What am I talking about? I brought them up because they were the most heavily vaccinated earliest. There's that. There's your India Delta variant again. There's that. It doesn't mean they can't be right, but I have no clue what they're talking about in the media or the news or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I call it infotainment. Uh, where they're trying to like scare the life out of people. It doesn't mean they can't be right. There's a chance they can be right and something weird can happen and all the events could turn around and the B1617-2 is exactly what they said it is. But observational data leading up to that doesn't support that uh, that conclusion. All right, and there's, look at this, check this out. This is all the variants. I know you probably can't read it with a 4K. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, heat map. Uh, it's like it's like pretty, but still, this is all the variants that are out there so far that have been measured. I regret you can't read as clearly as I can from what I have here. And your variant correlation to India. Uh, and so you can see all the way through there. And this is a pair plot. And fortunately, what happened was I did the pair plot when there's only four variants listed. And then everything got listed. And then I got like a super pair plot. There's that. And here's all your variant ratios. You see right there. Boom, boom, boom. Da, da, da. And I guess you can tell what that one is, right? In the Delta variant. And then, see what done that one is? 100%. It means like, wow, it's like came around and said, hey, you know what? I'm the Indian Delta variant and you guys are going to go away. And that's kind of what looks like it happened right there to there. All right. And there's this. Doo -doo -doo. And let's see if we go back down. The 16162. There's that. And there's that. Interesting, isn't it? It's like 
and then what's this one? This is Israel. And look at that. Isn't that weird? You see, it's like, so it's uniform across many dynamics. And of course, other stuff, because I'm always looking for bad stuff. All right, let's go through real fast. Ba, 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 ba. We looked at India. Oh, check, let's check out the world real fast. And then we're gonna, we'll probably call it a night. All right, check this out. New deaths, new cases. This is mortality percentage. And this is new cases. Look at that pattern. You see that there? All right, and then that's fully vaccinated, the right mortality percentage. Look at the mortality percentage just drop. Again, not a lot of the world is fully vaccinated. So you can't really draw that correlation to the drop in mortality. It would it doesn't, doesn't hold water. And it didn't happen with social distancing. It didn't happen with lockdown. It didn't happen with any of that. In fact, the, the irony about it, it seems like, think about this, there's only correlation, not making a statement, until the lockdowns began to ease. Did this actually begin to start happening? It's right here, mid-June. Then keep that in mind. This is world vaccines mortality percentage. And so people fully vaccinated, uh, basically per 100 globally is about 12%. So just, so take food for thought. And there's, uh, that's a vaccine to mortality correlation. And then, yeah, that's messed up, messed up, messed up. And there's your new cases, Asia, so on and so forth. I think there's a really nice chart right here. And that gives you a good idea. Remember that the world was going to fall apart about a month ago? And then all of a sudden, look at that. That's freaking amazing. All right, let's go real fast. We looked at that. Let's not go with that. Hospital occupancy. California. There's that. And remember, give us 15 days and we'll flatten the curve. Yeah, and but does it make a difference? LA just started ordering masks again, and after all the information in reference to scientists delving into the use of masks in real world settings, we know what the outcome to that one is. Now let's look at this. Remember they're talking about the Delta variant in Arkansas? It's like, oh, they need to vaccinate because they're not vaccinated enough. Let's let's put that to the test. After you can read this massively confusing chart, Arkansas, there's right there, you have that little rise of mortality right there. I go by mortality. I'm not going by positivity anymore because obviously a lot more people are testing positive, but we'll talk about the lethality of the variant. All right, there's that. And let's look at this. Let's look at do, 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 do. And we go to Maine. They have a little spike there. And we look around in other areas. And let's just say, for example, let's take, remember the whole world was going against Arkansas. Well, let's look at Arkansas and let's compare it to Maine. Let's see what their vaccine reactions are. Bum, bum, bum. Vaccine, uh, how would you describe it? Not vaccine reactions. Let's see what their vaccine percentages are. So let's see, Arkansas, right there. Maine, so right there, one, two, three, four. Maine's right there. So about over 70% of the people are vaccinated in Maine. And obviously, one, two, three, four. About a little over 40% of the individuals are fully vaccinated in above the age of 12 in Arkansas. And then we look at this. Do, 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 do. And what do we have? Looks pretty much a little lighter. And this is what per 100,000. Again, so we are comparing apples to apples. And looks pretty much the same. And uh, we look at the Utah, Montana, a little bit of hot spike. But that's really all, all you have. Again, it's not so much looking at Washington. Look at that jump in Washington. Let's see what Washington's vaccination rate is. And then we'll call it a night. Here it goes. Do do up, raw one. Oh, 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 almost forgot the mutations. All right, let's go to the mutations real fast. All right, here we are. United States, total COVID vaccines, fully vaccinated, total cases. New vaccinations, correlation 84.32% between that and positivity rate. That's not a negative. That's not a negative, all right? So I want you to pay attention to that. All right, the correlation between new test booth and new vaccinations, where's the correlation? Correlation between uh, new tests and new cases, only 87.745621. And let's continue around. Correlation between new tests and new cases. If you look at all the areas of the world per se, Singapore, and where's the United States? There's the United States right there. 
So it's interesting that the correlation between testing and cases is so correlated. And so you could take something like this. So let's say, for example, let's take, do, 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 do. let's take, um, let's see if this doesn't freeze on me real fast. Let's try India. Since we're doing up wrong one, India. All right, here it goes. So go India. And let's look at the correlations real fast there. So we break it down. Da, 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 there's that. I don't need to do that. Let's see what comes out there. All right, here goes all the charts. And so let's see what the correlations there. There's the population, there's India. Total COVID vaccinations. Remember, about it was about 6%. Total cases, right there. Fully vaccinated people is right there. Population, 1,380,000,000, and so on and so forth. And so the correlation between vaccinations and positivity rate is only 38.39%. How could it be that high? Because you only have 6% of the population being fully vaccinated. Uh, new vaccinations to test smooth, a little higher. And then you don't have really a correlation between uh, new tests and new cases. So it makes you think, food for thought. And again, there's all your charts. But let's wrap it up because we have, ah, it's past 60 minutes. Here we go. Do, do, do. All right, real fast. Update number, alert number six. They're tired of uploading people that they have not found any solid evidence. Reference to masks making any difference, uh, at least in the annals of internal medicine. Not my opinion, only the opinion of researchers. Hopkins News, dietary supplements. Again, I have the link. Wonderful, wonderful, small abstract, but incredible reference list. COVID-19, again, azithromycin. Hmm. All right, that's all I'm going to go for there. Uh, Studying uh, outbreaks in reference to those vaccinated. Um, yeah, not exactly uh, great advertising slick. But however, though, read through it carefully. They'll still promote it. Of course they have to. But still just the same. Not as dramatically protective as once implied. But again, they'll want to make they'll make you say, well, if the vaccine doesn't work, then you have to wear a mask. Well, guess what? The same. And then we go to da da CDC. Where's our data source? Wonderful. The CDC has done a good job accumulating data overall, even though it's kind of funny. Their data source is obviously our world and data, which is our friends here. And again, that's the vaccinating population. Outbreak info, crazy beautiful charts, wonderful, wonderful tracking. Again, you most I would not be surprised in some sort of not exactly cool way. You wouldn't see that artwork uh, covering someone's wall. Uh, VARES database, and of course, just random news articles from individuals, which I don't think were intended on making fake news. Um, uh, vaccinations reduced chance of COVID death in India to 0.4%. All right, and whatever. And uh, we'll take it from there. Again, gratitude to all the great researchers, just the same. Again, to John Hopkins, Harvard, Stanford. Did, well, I took all the popcorn courses on data science and Python, which really uh, basically helped me become enthralled with the Python language itself. And I'm just an amateur, and there's plenty of people much, much better than I am, which I am in awe of. But however, though, they're not looking at this, so I'll do it in the meantime. Again, gratitude, thank you, good night, and I'll see you all next week. Catch you then. Bye.